So we've had within this presentation a mixture. We've had glimpses of how <clears throat> new cities are going to look in terms of uh, managing. I'm, I'm going to stand so you can. You're, um, um, uh, how they're going to look if we are designing them from scratch. But we're also being told at the other extreme, maybe we're doing that design wrongly in some ways. We've shown how water sensitive cities uh, are using water as part of their landscaping and planning, how we can build in flood protection uh, and other aspects uh, in terms of air changing environment. We're also talking about resource scarcity, and Neil in particular talked about the phosphorus uh, crisis, which if you saw just a couple of years ago, phosphorus uh, ores tripled in price. Uh, they've subsequently come back down again, but it is a big issue which we're going to, to be talking about. So here we have more and more concentration in, into urban cities. We have more and more of their consumption of resources, but somehow or other we have also got to make them sustainable. We have glimpses of how we're doing this uh, and we have to think of people. <clears throat> we have seen how communities can drive these changes uh, from Sao Paulo um, and how when communities get behind this that we can, we can do this. We've seen how financing and some strong-willed financing from the World Bank says to, I hope I'm quoting Michael correctly, if it doesn't do this, we'll send it back. <laughs> You'll get it right, and you'll resubmit it until you get it right. There's not many people get that opportunity, but money's always an attractor. Uh, we've, we've seen, uh, from Hendrik, we've seen how cities which uh, have, have lost major industries, how reinventing themselves and doing urban design, which is going to be leading to uh, the future cities and how we do this. We've seen from Ulf how starting from from scratch, you can really do a wonderful concept of an echo city, which is based on experience and is, a, is in a sense, quite different because it's a north-north <laughs> transfer, even though some people may as a north-south transfer, but it is something which, show, which shows where you can really make a difference. And here we come back to Paul, who started it all by saying, we really, in terms of this vision, we are still developing it. Uh, we've gone a long way, and, and in the five, six years when this, all these things started coming together, uh, we've gone a long way in terms of making this happen. We're recognising the issues, but in some ways, things still aren't happening. So I come to Paul and say, why doesn't a Minister for Water Resources get the money, and the World Bank will tell you, it, it's a guaranteed increase in GDP if you just invest in water supply and sewerage, why aren't we doing this? Why aren't we using some of the systems? Uh, uh, and how do we make these politically acceptable? What are the mechanisms? And I'll go through each, each of you to say, what are these mechanisms, and, and specifically about some of your things, uh, to give a little bit of extra time to deal with these. Then I'm going to invite you all to come up with questions. And if you haven't got any questions, I've got a million. So. <laughs> You can, we can, uh, I'll, I'll invite you to bring in some of the questions. So, Paul. Yep, well, I'd start off by uh, pointing out that um, I'm a, I am a social scientist who's worked with engineers my whole life. So I have a great deal of respect for engineers, but I know how they think. And, 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 the, and, the, and part of the problem lies in the engineering community, whether you're talking about the regulator, you're talking about the consultants or the utilities, all of them. They, they, they've grown up in an environment where you're only remembered for your last mistake. There really is nothing in the game, right, that rewards. If, if, let me just give you an example. In the airline industry, the, the, the cost per passenger, I mean the fuel per passenger mile, right, has plummeted since the 707, right? And if you look at, 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 the, at the efficiency of most of the plants that we run, they've, uh, the, it's not, almost not even a consideration, it's small. Be, and so we've got, a, we've got an issue about conservatism on the one hand, the, the lack of incentive, right, for innovation on the other hand, and a real genuine fear that I'm gonna screw up. 
And, and if you look at, actually, if you really look sociologically at, at this field, you really have the Roman system, and we, Perroni now, always, he always says, thank God for the Romans, right? And it's true, because if it weren't for the Romans, we would, we, it would be even worse. But we have the, we have the Roman system with, with a Victorian overlay, and that more or less is where this field you know, is with the addition of advanced wastewater treatment plant, and thank God for membranes, right? I mean, that, that's sort of the stack. And, you know, we don't have, no, but nobody has a, gi a giant incentive, right, to break the mold. But we need to break the mold. How do we do that? We really need to do what, exactly what we've been doing for the last two or three years, which is building places like uh, Tanchan, you know, and, and also in Xi'an in China, there's about five things going on there. You've got cities in the U.S. and Sweden. You've, you've got... Um, Places like Australia, which are a big laboratory. So, what the way you, the way, in my opinion, it's not about ministers and it's not about finance. It's actually about convincing the engineers that there's a better way to do this, and that if they try it, they're not going to get blamed for anything. And if and if you get there, the rest will take care of itself. That's my take on this. Hendrik, what's your thoughts on that? Is, is Paul right? <laughs> I, I'm not really sure it is absolutely... Oh, sorry, I need to... Sure, you right. do. Um, to, to some extent, I think Paul is right. Uh, there is conservatism within the sector, sure, there is. And uh, for, for different reasons, as you were saying, and the risk of doing something wrong is, is really there. It's, it's uh, certainly there. And, um, but to some extent, I think um, in, in the last years, there's been, a, a, I think there, there are more, people are challenging the system. Yeah. And I think that's very, very good. And I, I loved the presentation by Neil because he was you know, challenging. And uh, I think it's good because that is really what we need, obviously, in order to improve the systems. We, we need guys that can challenge it, but obviously, I think we also have to try it to see if, it, if it's actually better than the one we have, because it, it's, it survived for a good long time, and uh, that must be for some reason. It, it's not only conservatism, I'm sure. Neil, so what's different in Durban? What's, what led you to, to have to be innovative, to be creative? What are the, what are the things which led to this? Well, I guess one word would be survival. Um, because we had a challenge that didn't seem to have a solution. We, we had all these millions of people. We couldn't afford to provide conventional solutions, so we had to find something else. Water was easy. As I said, you just lay a few small pipes and water's there. Sanitation is not that easy. And so that's where we turned to sanitation and then started speaking to people who'd been thinking out of the sector and found that there was a whole lot more to this thing that really was, um, it was possible to package them all together and maybe find a solution that addressed all of those things and take this big step forward. So um, that was the driver. And then the next thing was how to sell it to the politicians. In a way, that's why I disagree with Paul slightly, that politicians end up making the decisions about where the money is allocated. And if you don't respect the politicians as a board of governors or directors and and take them along and explain the issues to them, then you can't expect them to get excited about something, because this is something new. They're also conservative. They want to get re-elected. So if you put something in that's going to get egg on their faces, then you're going to have also a very short career in the place. So it was trying to find hooks to hang these thoughts on to get them to agree to put hundreds of millions of euros into these projects. Um, and then they start seeing the benefits. And then, of course, the pressure is the reverse. Now, why can't you go faster? Uh, and then the conservatism comes and you pull back. So I partly agree with Paul, but I think it's more than just the, the conservative engineers. Neil, Neil can, I, can I say I completely agree with Neil. It, it's just that until the thought is that until you're ready to go and, and, and convince them, they're never going to move. That's, that, That's you know, right? So it's, 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 it's that, that engineering element I'm talking about, right? Is, nece is, is necessary but not sufficient. How about that, right? You, have, you need a bunch of things to happen. Well, we'll just leave that one there. Michael, would you, as, you know, if it's part of the World Bank, would you fund something which is really innovative, really out there, put your money behind it, very high risk, might lose your shirt, 
might lose your reputation. You're in a worse position than the engineers. <laughs> We're not very good at it, to, to be honest. Uh, and, and part of it uh, may be risk aversion, but, but I, don't even, I don't even see that as, as, the, as the worst issue. I think as an institution, we, we are willing to uh, deal with risk. We are willing to say, we're going to take a risk, and this is how we'll manage it, et cetera, et cetera. And if I bring, as a task team leader, as a project manager, a project to my manager saying, you know, this is innovative, this is new, this is how I want to do it, and these are the risks of doing it. I can get it approved, and I, if it goes wrong, I'm, I'm still okay as, as a person, and my career is not in ruins. But, but I think that the, 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 the problem is somewhere else. I think the problem is really um, that we're so busy. We've got so many projects that, 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 that we need to turn out. So what do I do when I, when, I, when I do my terms of reference? You know, I take the ones I used three years ago or the ones you used on your last project, and you know, somehow they're written up to allow traditional uh, technology, but not to allow new technology. So then, so then Neil comes along and he says, you know, I've got this great idea, and I'm saying, so you're not complying with my terms of reference. I think that, that sort of, 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 of issue is, 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 is much bigger, and it's not just because we're bad guys, but it's also because, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, Rosa, could, would your community accept innovative technology? We've heard how the gold standard, the perception, perception is reality. <laughs> How do you convince your communities? How do you get them to sign off on something which is innovative and different and then drive the World Bank to say, throw those specifications out. We want Neil specifications, not 20-year-old ones developed in, in mid-London. <laughs> uh, I, I think in this case, of uh, this platform we are managing, uh, it's not an innovation. We are just putting in practice the, the, the old the traditional uh, actions uh, that uh, every municipality has to be done a long time and we are, we are asking for. But I, I think the, the first thing is to change the minds. The engineer minds, the bank minds, the technician minds, because uh, what they had already said is that the, 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 the problem in the, in the environmental agency that has to, to license the, the, the program, the projects, they uh, are always uh, with a, a, a certain uh, doubt about the, the, the new technologies. You have to prove it's, it's solving. So I think we have to, to start with simple things and uh, with demonstration uh, and uh, talking and talking and talking and why changing the, the, the things. <laughs> so, Ulf, as a planner, you know, everything's good practice, evidence-based planning, you know, great concepts, wonderful designs and so on. How do you build new technologies in of the revolutionary type? How can you start with something completely new and say, no, I actually want to... I don't want to put in uh, a three-foot sewer. I want to put in a three-inch sewer. <laughs> yeah, I think the, as planner, you start to, to work with the overall, I think the over long-term uh, structure, urban structure, physical structure, and the structure should be so flexible that it can be uh, meet different needs for the future and different changes. So, so I think uh, um, what I try to promote is a kind of experimental, that a new city should be a kind of experimental field for different technologies. Uh, I think uh, we have lots of discussion in Tangshan, for example, uh, if a centralized system is the right way to go, because you, for example, it should be very fruitful to pick up such uh, very new innovative ideas as is from Durban, for example, in order to develop uh, new technology in the periphery of this uh, large city where you don't have the connectivity to the central. So to combine different systems I think is very important and one thing is uh, I think it's positive here that uh, this pilot plant that has been started up as a small scale effort in Tangshan where this uh, separation of grey water and black water which is not uh, uh, not implemented anywhere in China. That is one example where you can start to look upon uh, better utilization of resources uh, if nutrients can be uh, 
uh, developed for uh, agriculture and so on. So I think this kind of pilot plants, there's also other efforts, for example, in um, energy to have blocks where you have self-sufficient blocks, where you have a ground heat combined with solar, combined with uh, energy efficient buildings uh, according to some standards and so on. So, so I think that should be the way to go, not to plan to totally top down. The, the old planner uh, made it top down. So to say, uh, this, this kind of hierarchical planning, you made the plan, it was fixed. Everything was kind of uh, fixed for maybe centuries. But in the modern planning, it should be more flexible and adaptable, I think. Neil, wouldn't you love to be able to do this? Have the money, the resources to be able to... And if you did have that, how would you do it? Okay, you see, I think the mistake we've made is engineers have been looking at this problem for I don't know how long, a century. And I think we're now realizing that the solution lies beyond necessary engineering. There's social component to it. There's a science component to it. And so I think we've got to start bringing in people from other fields to help us solve these problems. I think that's, that's what we're not good at. So we, we need some way of, of bringing in people like a, a coatings person who's, you know, who's made some coating that nobody wants but actually will repel our waste that we can use in a, as a, a set of ceramics on a toilet, that kind of thing. So that's what I would like to do is to try and, which is what people like the Gates Foundation are doing, trying to bring people and they've got nothing to do with our sector to, to help us solve the problems. Because if we found the product that solves the problem, like we found the cell phone, 4G, we don't have to market it. It just took over. And the, the, the marketing forces came and it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So to me, once we find the new gold standard, I just stand back and it'll happen. Paul, then Hendrik. <laughs> well, well, I'd like to redeem myself with the engineering community here because I'm actually very <laughs> fond of you. Um, but <laughs> I am actually. Uh, but but just, just to say that, that um, while you asked me, you framed the problem of what, what's been in the way, I mean, what's, what's the solution is the vanguard of engineers. That are, going to, that are going to rethink this problem. And I think, Neil, back to your, your comment, I think the engineering community of today and the vanguard that's sitting here wants to work with, with a much bigger group of people, right? Mm -hmm. And they want to, they realize that they're part of a, of, of a community of, of participants. You know, the Cities of the Future conference that was here, half of that was planners, right? And they want to work with, it, uh, with architects and they want to work with, with community groups. And if you look at, at Melbourne and, and, and Singapore. So we are the solution, guys. Um, and, uh, and I hope I get that message to you across, but it's, there's a difference between where the solution lies and where the problem came from, okay? Yep. Okay, Hendrik, uh, then Michael, and then Ulf. <laughs> and then we'll go to questions from the floor. I, I think it was mentioned in terms of reference, what sort of solution is to be solved. And uh, uh, as, as, for example, uh, the, the, the recycling of nutrients uh, is one Sorry. of the questions. Uh, Neil uh, put a lot of stress on it, and I try to, uh, to say that I think this is a question for the future. But uh, as I also mentioned, today, this is not a top priority, at least not on the political agenda, as I can understand it. So that means that, there, I mean, we need, uh, that there need to be drivers for, for this to happen. And within the environmental uh, sector, uh, the, the, the drivers are usually uh, somehow, there are political drivers, but because uh, the market is not always there. Uh, I work a lot with waste, uh, solid waste and, and solid waste handling, and uh, it's, it's quite evident that uh, there, there are drivers where, where there's a market, things happen very, very rapidly. In some cases, they do happen too rapidly. They, uh, there, there, there are other things like social uh, aspects that I find somehow, well, I'd, there, there's something more to say about it. But there are other sectors within the waste uh, where there isn't a market, and that's where the politics come in, if this is the right way to go. And, and uh, for that, mean, that means that we really have to, to you know, fight upstream, to, to, to really uh, swim upstream. And, and that's always a, a bigger challenge than uh, just... Um... So that's one, one key to conservatism, I think, also. Uh, we need to know what we want to do. So, Michael, is money the way to do it? 
Well, well li listening to, 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 to our discussion here, you can get the sense that if, if we were not that conservative and, 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 and if, if we didn't have that much old-fashioned engineering, we wouldn't have the problem. And, and I think that's only right to a very small degree. I mean, when comparing with telecommunications, for example, there is a huge difference. Water still is a natural monopoly. There is no competition. The, the, the development you saw in telecoms came when you opened up for, t for, 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 for competition. You know, when you still had the, the old telecoms, fixed line companies having a monopoly, nothing happened. You know, even in Denmark, you would call them up. You would hang on the phone for an hour to just get somebody to talk to, and they would tell you they would come out in three weeks and fix your problem, right? So, so and now it's completely different, and it's competition that's a big difference. So I think that's one, one, one big difference bloody hard to make competition in, 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 in water and wastewater. That's another problem. Then, then, then I think we shouldn't under, underestimate that there are real difficulties with many of these uh, uh, new solutions that we are talking about. You need to change building codes. You need to change health codes. You need to get a lot of people involved and collaborating that are not used to, to collaborate. And it's, it's not that, that easy. Ulf? <laughs> You, you deal with all these things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all, all, of, all of us do, I think. And uh, some reflections about it. But, I mean, the urban challenges are so complex. It's very com complex to plan develop cities. It's a kind of life itself because everything should be connected. And I think it could not be met by sector approach. But at the same time, your institutions are... Uh, there are water, waste, energy companies uh, maybe divided in smaller subunits for specialized uh, entities and so on. And I think also uh, it fits in with the tradition in engineering, I think, where you have also developed in education a very sectoral approach. So I think that is a large constraint for, for development. So I think you have to develop more uh, transdisciplinary. You say you go from interdisciplinary to transdisciplinary because you involve not only uh, I mean, engineers has to collaborate. I think planners and architects maybe, um, maybe can be inspire engineers to collaborate more with each other. I, me I mean, uh, reflected on this in our projects, that engineers are very specialized, but uh, they need also to develop skills for more holistic uh, approaches uh, to combine their technical skills with this holistic approach. And I think also we have to look upon ecosystem services, uh, for example, because uh, that will be, as we talked about food, uh, we have to have a new uh, new specialists in that field and also the social science of people working with behavior because uh, maybe 20% of the consumption is related to behavior so that's really challenge to get this together I think that uh, that also the, we need to um, uh, also be supported by the political the political community has also to uh, embrace the need of uh, cross-disciplinary yeah. Well, we've heard about cross-disciplinary work, and we have a filthy monopolist at the end there, <laughs> who I'm sure would like to comment on this. You see, I saw a picture that Eddie Perry has put up this morning. There's a billion people in developed city situations in the world. There's six billion who are the customers I'm talking about, who don't have services or have substandard services. If we move away from the centralised paradigm to a decentralised paradigm, where small businesses can collect this waste and process it. All you need to do is have a franchising system where you say, you can have the waste in that area. And if it is seen as a resource and not as a cost, it immediately changes. And we, as I said yesterday, have just had a tender close to take our sewage sludge from our conventional works, where we've been paying 7 million euros a year for it to be disposed of. For the first time ever, two of the tenders have offered to pay me money for our sludge. So they see a value in it. So I think the market is turning. And if we can get the logistics model right for the, for the informal sector, we create jobs in developing countries, which is a major issue. So you have job creation, cleaner environment. I won't have to go and check if they're taking the sludge out the pits, because they can hopefully sell it and make a business out of it. I'd have the other problem that they're going to be squabbling with, you've come into my area to take my urine and sludge away, and please, Minister Municipality, get them out of my area. So I think the paradigm will change. So and, I won't, and I won't be the monopoly. <laughs> so we, we have two things. Of course, this was done in Japan a hundred years ago and have been going on for centuries, uh, which is really interesting. 
And one of my previous chairmen used to say he would love to see the day when you had guards with shotguns riding on the waste, treat, waste uh, from uh, the treatment plants. <laughs> More precious than gold. Right, now we'll just suspend this. Fascinating. Uh, what questions have we got from, from our audience? Glenn, first of all. There's a, there's a microphone coming. Uh, name, organisation, and a brief question, please. Uh, Glenn Dyger, CH Tom Hill, and uh, NIWA. I want to point something out. The, Michael showed us a graph or a chart showing the increase in water. And one of them was the, uh, one of the line items was, was the US, where it was projected that, the, that water demand was going to go up by 43%. Uh, actually, water use in the US has been constant for the last 20 years. I think. One of the big problems is that we, we have a bunch of paradigms about uh, what's going to happen, but they're inconsistent with reality. We really don't see, uh, we don't really see things, uh, we, we don't really see the situation that, that we're dealing with. I think the biggest problem that we have is that we are, what we do is based on practice. Our problem is that everything we do is based on practice, and Michael also talked about this. You, you issue a TOR because it's, that's, what you, that's what you've done in the past, right? That's just an example, but we, but we, you know, that's what we do. We keep doing these things because we think they're the right things to do. So this is coming to a question. The question is, how do we move from a practice-based approach to this, to, to addressing water and sanitation, to a performance-based approach. How do we focus on performance? So we're just too damn comfortable doing what we've been doing, even though it's not meeting the. How do we move to a practice-based or, or a performance-based approach? All right. So who would like to field that one? I mean, the quick example I always say is we get rid of the consultants, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> But that, that, is, uh, that's, that, that, that is, uh, is not the answer. Um, so, how do we do this? Michael. Well, I, I, I have to be honest, and I think we, we did ourselves a big disservice like 10, 15 years ago when, when we had that opportunity and instead we decided to, 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 to write an ideological banner saying private sector will solve all our problems. And, and somehow we linked that up with performance. So we mixed up two things that really do not necessarily go together. And, and, and we made it very difficult for, for, for ourselves. Now, I completely agree with what's behind your question, that exactly we need to move to performance because that will also help us you know, to get rid of the monopoly, to basically look at what, what we need is to, to give people uh, uh, clean water and, 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 and to take care of their waste, not necessarily through the existing systems, but through whatever, whatever system uh, you, you want. And, and, and we are doing experiments, with, and especially doing experiments on the social side, because we have big problems with the slums, and there we are doing a number of performance-based uh, experiments. But, but your idea that maybe we should do it on a grander scale in terms of, you know, looking at what comes out of the system rather than the system itself, I think is very interesting. Paul? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's, a, it's the perfect question, actually, and, and there's lots of answers to it, I think. But if we think about in the, in the traditional systems, right, the big systems, we're thinking in IWA about setting up a lead-like system, right? You know what lead is, is a way of rating buildings, and there's competition between buildings to be greener and to look, you know, and, and the architects have no problem, they, they, they don't have a conservatism problem. They're ready to go, so. Um, but if, if you can imagine that, that systems, city systems, like Stockholm, right, got rated and compared, right? So there's a league table. Nobody wants to be on the bottom of the league table. So at least one, one element of an answer, I think, is to make, a, make that performance more clear and transparent and create some quasi-competition so that there, so, so the cities have an incentive, right? And engineers have an incentive and mayors have an incentive to do the right thing and to look good. 
So maybe that'll help. We're working on that in Busan, by the way. So, Glenn, it appears I was wrong. The answer is we've got to give you more incentives. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe one thing. One comment to that. Yes. I'm, I'm flattered by this, uh, that you say that we are so open-minded. Uh, uh, one thing, maybe it's about, uh, as I see as planner, the, I, some methodologies that we use, uh, maybe here, and maybe you too, the backcasting methodology, where you, it's legitimate to work very long-term and to develop alternatives uh, from a white paper, so to say, and uh, develop alternatives out of specific long-term objectives, and then go back to the real reality and develop it systematically, how you can go to these innovative solutions system, uh, stepwise. So I think to allow for this type of approach, because I think if you just go from, I really agree with this, if they're practice-based system, you, you just do minor changes or something that is existing and you can never come out of your, you are restricted to reality all the time. But if you can uh, develop uh, comprehensive way of working in this uh, backcasting way. I think it could be one way out of this dilemma. So, next question, somewhere, somewhere here in the middle. Yes. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Günther from University of Munich. I have a question to Neil. Uh, I read a little bit about your Durban experience and uh, I, I was, my question was how, which problems, technical, social, political problems you had and how do you solve them? Because it's very important also, because I think it's a very good approach you made, and therefore our, your experience in solving problems is also very important. Okay, in a way, that's Glenn's question in another way. And I was thinking what Albert Einstein said about the definition of madness, a person that does the same thing over and over again and expects different results. Um, so, we had to change, right? And rather than just talking to ourselves as professionals, start talking to the decision makers, to the politicians, to communities. So you become more of a marketer. And I think our biggest problem is proving not to be the technical stuff, but the social and the that side of things, dealing with people's perceptions of, of uh, what is an acceptable service, a flushing toilet, um, water coming out of a tap in your house, that kind of thing. So it's, it's more about behavior change. That's changing this conception or perception that sewage is a waste that is harmful to you, to something that is a resource that is actually going to be part of ensuring the future survival of this planet. Because when all the phosphorus is finished, what are we going to use to grow these crops? Because there is, there is no more. So it's, it's trying to find new alliances and new people to talk to. So we invest a lot of time and money in talking to communities and politicians and trying to find other people out of the sector to bring about the change. We would never have done it on our own. So I think that's, that's the biggest challenge, is finding out who really does know something. A lot of people will tell you they've got solutions, but they call them snake oil salesmen. You know, Take this potion, it'll cure you of anything. And uh, pit additives is a classic one. The number of people that have come and told me, you put this powder in your pit toilet, it'll make all the fecal sludge disappear. I think we've tested 40 now and not one has worked. Bicarbonate of soda works better than any of them. So, you know, it's, that's the problem. You have all these people coming to you and it's trying to work out what works and what doesn't work. That, that's the problem. Comments? Besides, besides the social side. Comments from any other panel members on the question? All right, uh, Francois? Um, hello, I'm Francois, I'm from GWP. Uh, since three days only. Huh? <laughs> um, well, thank you very much for the great presentations and also the very dynamic uh, dialogue we, we have listened to. And, and um, listening to you and, and watching the presentations, I, um, I really thought that uh, something that is very attractive uh, in what we are doing now, it's an invitation to live differently, to consume differently, to produce differently. We, I mean, it's, it's a cultural aspect. We are invited to, to a, new, a new way of behavior. And, uh, and so I think really this is what makes you dream very much. I mean, I was looking at these beautiful pictures with water, uh, green spaces. I was imagining myself uh, inside there. What a nice life, really. I mean, what a beautiful, uh, idealistic life we, we are offering uh, for the future in the cities. 
So there's really, um, but it requires a different way of living and of thinking, of behaving with your neighbor, etc. So the cultural aspect is very strong. Now, uh, my question is, is that it's not beautiful for everybody. Uh, in, uh, last, uh, I mean, uh, yesterday in the Africa meeting, uh, there was a session on forward thinking of what, what are the next big priorities. Urbanization came as one. And when you speak about urbanization, you speak about urban poverty rising also very fast. So how do you see this? I mean, I don't know who to ask this to, but you, I mean, Neil, you've got a, partly a solution as well, but how can you actually match these beautiful green things that we have seen there and, and, and urban poverty rising on a very fast? Is, is there some way to deal about that? Go ahead, Neil. <laughs> uh, let somebody else talk first. All right. Yeah, Hendrik first. I think the question is very interesting. So uh, this is not what I do in, in general, but um, urban poverty, I mean, there, there's some, um, to some extent, it's also a, an old question because um, I've, I've heard about innovative cities because uh, that's really what, what one of my sort of drivers or, or where I see that cities can actually create differences is that uh, in the cities, people come together, you actually see the problem. And that's one of the first things. If you see the problem, you know it is a problem and then you can set about to solve it. And that is really uh, one of, of my questions really to my, my colleagues here because uh, I, I, I'm very interested in, in especially the, the phosphorus thing, but which will come first, the water or the phosphorus? Because if, if the water will be a driver for, for doing things within the water sector, that may influence the wastewater sector. And my sort of thinking is maybe this leap will take place in another place not in, in my country, but somewhere else. So, 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 so really to, 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 to know, to see w where you have a problem is, is really, uh, and that's what cities are good for. So, Paul. Yeah, uh, Francois, I'd like to make uh, the case that people move to cities and, and get p appear poor because they're gonna be better off in the longer run, right? And they're on their way up the latter and, and will be better off. And what we need to think about is how to make the cities, you know, in the aggregate, right? Uh, places that are moving up, right? And where opportunities are rising, because those people are better off than they were where they came from. That's why they moved. I, I believe that. And so, what, if we're going to make the city better off in the aggregate, maybe we should start by making water and sanitation function well, cost a lot less, be incremental, you know, in its nature, right? Because that's going to make the city more successful, and and that the city, it, it is going to translate its cost to all these residents, one way or another, right? So actually, we can reduce poverty, right, in cities by dealing with the infrastructure and the basic stuff that we're talking about a lot more smartly. So, all okay. just I think it's uh, just one second. It's an extremely difficult question and has uh, many answers, of course. So I cannot give some, but uh, some reflections. I think you need to work on different levels. I mean, uh, the strategies for cities are very, very, uh, very so poor many times because uh, you have strategies where the urban settlements allow to grow without any structure, without connection to transportation, in wrong positions, in landslide areas. A very risky area. So, I mean, you have to develop a citywide or regional wide strategies where you really uh, have the opportunity to meet different demands for different affordability. And, and even if you cannot solve poverty issue at once, it's, uh, but I agree, there is a successive improvement in the world. You have to uh, allow for or offer different sort of uh, niches in the city strategy where people can live in, in their specific level, but also develop more of mixed uh, use and in uh, different way. If you see a, 
uh, good city in the world. Often uh, you can reflect that it's mixed, uh, different kind of populations live there and different uh, income levels and social cultural levels and so on. So I think you should in the planning also allow for this because today it's a very much of segregated planning that um, developers work to de develop gated communities and so on. So you have to uh, counteract to this. And then I think uh, one another, but you have of course lots of existing areas that you have to do something also on a small scale. And I then think the Durban experience is extremely interesting. And I think also some interesting things from um, uh, the favelas in, in Brazil, for example, where you have small uh, efforts to successive change, uh, introduce uh, a small scale transportation system, could also be uh, to have a successive uh, uh, improvement of a building, uh, allow for this uh, supplement with decentralized water and sewage. And so, so I think. Uh, you should work on a more strategic level, as I said from the beginning, but also in parallel with sort of small-scale pilot projects that uh, showcase sort of good uh, options, uh, which then could be combined with these strategies as a whole. <laughs> Neil. Yeah, I didn't answer first because I, I still don't actually know how to answer the question sensitively, but I think it, th that feeling of well-being to me is a relative thing. So, you know, a person with nothing will be happy if some of those needs are met. When I look at the public services that we provide to people, electricity, roads, water, sanitation is one of the most inequitable services in that you have a pit in the ground or you have a flushing toilet. And those basically are the two options that we offer. We don't have a gradation of services like we have in other things. It's, it's a pit or a flushing toilet and very little in between. Whereas with transport, you can have a taxi and a bus and a bicycle and, you know, you know what I'm saying? And there's a, there's a pathway. So to me, that's, that's where we've, we've not um, done too well. So if we can find something that, that looks the same and is the same for rich and poor alike, which I think is what the toilet of the future will be, then we go a long way to dealing with this feeling of inequity and second class. And so that, that's where I was coming from. So Michael, are you prepared <clears throat> to go away from here, rewrite all the terms of reference, make sure that everybody uh, has uh, a, at least a urine-separating toilet, and then prescribe from now on uh, <clears throat> the, the systems are going to be different. Is this the sort of leadership which we can expect from the World Bank? I mean, that's actually my, my role, sitting in, in the water anchor. So the, the answer to your question is yes. It's not going to happen tomorrow or next month, but, uh, but we're working on it. Um, and, and, and one reason we are working on it is that, I mean, to be quite honest, the, the bank used to be relevant because we had a lot of money. You know, now, once we're out of the financial crisis, people will come back to realize that there are a lot of other people who have a lot of money, like BNDS in, in, in Brazil, they, they, they have a loan portfolio annually, that's three times the bank's global portfolio. I mean, we are, we are becoming a small kid on the block and we need to have value added in, 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 in other ways. And, and, and I think being in the forefront of, of some of these solutions is one of the ways we can do it. So Rosa, are you going to be able to go back to Sao Paulo and say, hey, we got it wrong. <laughs> We've actually got to do it the way Neil does it. <laughs> he, knew, he, he viewed the, the priorities to finance. <laughs> no, it's, it's a complicated thing. It, it, just to, to, to change, to, to, to finance, you have to, to, to have a good project, and be a, a very well elaborated, and we have problem with this. So it's one more thing to, to be thinking. <laughs> so, our question here at the front. Yes, so microphone's behind you. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm Cy Jones with the World Resources Institute, and um, back down to a more pragmatic level here, I'd like to ask, we've talked a lot about the, the decentralization and small-scale opportunities, but all in the context of the wastewater side, and I'm just wondering, especially for the new cities being designed from, from scratch, are there, what are the decentralized small-scale opportunities on the water supply, resource and supply side that you've looked at or considered? I think it's, uh, as it's a 
Very good question. And, and I think as it's a very long period of implementation, not long in a, in a Chinese perspective, it's, uh, it's kind of faster than in many countries, but uh, you, you develop it stepwise and every step has to have some solutions, I think. Uh, so it, it must start in kind of decentralized way. For example, the pilot plant that I show here is maybe up to 80,000 people. That is a small scale in China. And, and, um, and then you have to, I think, there is a kind of flexibility. You have to start decentralized, but maybe you can, in the future, decide to go for centralized solutions for certain of the systems. But it's not decided. You plan for possibilities, both for decentralized and centralized. And then you can have kind of mix also in the future. You cannot uh, decide for centralized because it's too expensive also to build out the centralized solution from the beginning. But in the long end, far end, you can decide on this. <clears throat> well, one of the questions with regard to decentralized, centralized is, of course, what, what is meant by decentralized. Uh, Durban, 3.8 million people living there, uh, and Malmö, 300,000. I mean, the, 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 uh, there's, there's a big gap there, right? Uh, and uh, so, so probably, uh, in, in, and, and when you go to China especially, you learn that decentralized means something else than, than what, what is decentralized, in my opinion. So the scale of it is, is, is very interesting in this aspect. And I think there is some, some of course, um, I'm an engineer, so there's optimum things to, to where you build different things because you can have some sort of benefits from actually building it in a certain scale. Uh, th that's... Paul, I think you have some words on the thoughts on yeah, this. Exactly this. I mean, let, let's, uh, I mean I, the world we live in is a world of polemics, right? And we talk about decentralized as though it's at the in situ level and centralized as it's like a city of 30 million, right? I mean, the fact is that, that, that there's a whole range of, 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 of there's a scale, there's a whole big scale issue here, not even talked about it uh, adequately here because we didn't have time. But basically what's happened is that the that membranes have, have made an order of magnitude change in the optimum scale. Order of magnitude, right? That's big. We're talking about 200,000 to 20,000, right? And so we should be thinking about, you know, more centralized, less centralized, and we should be talking in nuanced terms. The Germans use the word um, uh, semi-centralized, right? And they have a great philosophy. It should be as small as possible and as big as necessary. And, and, and that's a very profound <laughs> statement, you know? Small as possible, as, as big as necessary. Yeah. All right, last question then, and then we're, I think, be up for time. So, okay, a, a I'm uh, Jay Witherspoon with CH Tome Hill. A couple of sessions were dealing with the nexus of food, energy, and water. And I might suggest the fourth one is economics. I'm unclear about the sustainable cities that you're proposing that how they're going to deal with the, you deal with the physical aspect of water, but how about the virtual aspects of water? Uh, for example, some countries import 90% of their water in their food products or in their uh, clothing. And the second aspect is the energy footprint required to do some of the treatment schemes to harvest phosphorus or whatever. How is that going to play on the economic scale and does it have to be dealt with the true price of water? Some interesting questions, some interesting points there. Neil, you got your hand up first this time. <laughs> okay, one thing that separates developing countries from developed countries is that we have a lot of sunshine. And that is free energy. And we're finding that as a huge advantage in many of these solutions. But equally, as technology is unfolding, we're finding that, particularly on the sewage side, you can do this kind of treatment almost on an energy neutral basis. Even the Europeans are doing that mm -hmm. as we speak. So I think the energy equation here is, is the easier side to solve. Your, your question about virtual water, well, if we can move to local gardens, and that's what a lot of our nutrients are going to be used for, our use. We've got a whole lot of small gardens outside people's houses, in communities, communal gardens, where the, the nutrients, albeit not properly treated, are being used as a, as a as a food source, a pl plant food source. So once we can get that safe, then those gardens become safer. So, but that doesn't solve the, the whole city's problem. 
So I don't, I don't have an answer to your virtual water pot, but I think the energy consumption side, there's a lot of potential there. And, and plants are becoming more and more energy efficient, and we're being able to harness more and more of the energy that's in those natural resources. Yes, Michael? Uh, I, I see your, your question as part of a, of a bigger issue of how do we value resources properly, because it's not just about water. As Neil just said, it's also about energy, it's also about phosphor, it's also about clean air, etc. It's really about how do we value the, 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 the resources properly. And, and, and of course, there we have, uh, we have a number of, of, of problems on the energy side. We still have huge subsidies. Uh, we have very little taking into account global effects. Uh, on the water side, the same. We still have lots of, of, of subsidies and, and very little taking into account uh, external effects. So, so what, what we are trying to do as the bank is, is to, push, to push those issues. And I think to the extent that we are successful in those areas, the, 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 uh, the issue about virtual water will, will have less, less importance. And, and, one, and we're pushing in a couple of ways. We're pushing on the policy side, but, but we're also pushing in the, in the methodological side because, I mean, basically, we all, we all compare riches today by GDP flows. There's no considerations of stocks of resources in the way we compare whether a country is doing well or not. And, and, and that has both historical and methodological reasons, and, and, and we're pushing on that as well. A challenge for the economists. <laughs> Um, I, think, I think it's also a very interesting question, and it relates to, to, uh, to somehow to, to uh, all, all, all the, uh, 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 what I'm trying to say here is, is um, uh, the, the, um, the, everything will turn out as waste. And uh, th there's a direct link between the GDP and, and actually the amount of waste. You can see it. So when there's a recession, the amount of waste reflects that. So uh, how do we minimize waste? Because that's, that's really, and, and so far we haven't been very successful in the world in actually doing it. And there, there are some, some schemes, and, and I think uh, that there, there's been reports in, in, from Germany especially on, on, on some of the ideas of how to decouple GDP growth and waste growth. And there's one, one, one that's it's really a million dollar question because that's uh, resource management in its very essence we're talking about here. Right. Comments for anybody else? And uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll close up. Yep. Uh, Jay, I, I think that this is a really good question. I think we've, when we come back to, to really messed up accounting uh, as, as a measure, you know, I mean, we've got to get that straight first. If you talk to almost anybody in a European or an American uh, utility, They'll talk about economies of scale in terms of a wastewater plant, which actually occupies 20% of the cost, and 80% of the cost is tied up in the network, and nobody even talks about that, right? So I think our whole way of thinking about the system, right, is kind of messed up. So when we, then when we talk about optimizing things without even looking at them holistically, we have, we, you know, we have a kind of a fundamental problem, because then it makes it really hard to compare less centralized to more centralized solutions. Yeah, and, and we got we got a lot of work to do, I think. Any last comments from the panel? No, it all looks good. Well, we've seen some great examples, some great models. The message we got is really, it comes back to Jay's last questions. Whichever session, which, whichever system we select, we really do have to understand both the inputs, the outputs, the values we attach to each one, each part of that resource, and basically how we design, because this is going to be an intrinsic part of our cities for the future. We have, there's enough emerging technology, there's enough traditional technology that, in fact, we can use this mix and match. It is not a one solution fits all by any means. And we've seen whether it's community consultation as drivers, whether it's the World Bank, whether it's a critical need, as, uh, as in, in Durban, whether it's a totally new concept, uh, as it is in Tangshan, or whether it's rehabilitation of, 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 of old cities. And I, I think that the water professionals, uh, as Paul has uh, put it so, so well, 
have got this responsibility to actually take all these ideas, bring them together, and link with the other professionals in the area to make this happen. So I'd like you to give a great hand, please, to some wonderful presentations and great discussion. Thank you for the, uh, being a wonderful audience and uh, for your questions and also Perana uh, Malmquist, thank you for putting this together in the first place. Thank you.